Hello, good afternoon. This is Elena Rios, the uh, President and CEO of the National Hispanic Medical Association, and we're very happy to partner with the National Dairy Council tonight, or today, I should say, on our webinar that's called Fat or Fiction, The Science of Whole Milk, Dairy Foods, and Healthy Eating, eating Patterns. Uh, we have with us some outstanding speakers, uh, Dr. Janice Gideon, uh, registered dietitian, the director uh, of health and wellness partnerships at the National Dairy Council, and Dr. Moises Torres Gonzalez, who is the director of nutrition research at the National Dairy Council, and Dr. Karen Lima Vanales, uh, who is an NHMA member uh, and will be uh, moderating the session, and she is from, uh, I know she's from Arizona, I'm just trying to read this bio real fast. Uh, she's in her endocrinology fellowship, I think, at the University of Arizona Medical Center uh, of Phoenix and the VA health care system. Um, and I'm sorry, she's actually an associate program director of the endocrinology fellowship at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. So welcome all of you. Uh, we look forward to having you on the call and look, thank you all for participating and we hope you join us at other National Hispanic Medical Association events with the National Dairy Council uh, and uh, especially our national conference in Washington, D.C., April 30th to May 3rd. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Rios. I would like to start, uh, uh, this is Dr. Vinales, uh, I would like to start uh, by thank you all the organization for um, organizing this uh, incredibly um, helpful webinar. And as Dr. Rios has said, um, the name of the webinar is Fat or Fiction, the Science of Whole Milk Dairy Foods Within Healthy Eating Patterns. And uh, I would like to uh, get some reminders for the today's webinar. During the webinar, your lines will be muted throughout the webinar. The questions and answers, please type your questions into the chat box and follow along with the Dire uh, Nurses uh, Live and uh, uh, the hashtag NIHMA Dairy on social media throughout today's presentation as well. And back to the chat box, uh, the questions will be answered by um, in order of the questions that were made, um, and that's going to be on the end of the presentation. And after the webinar, the full webinar recording will be available at the www.nihmamd.org and the nationaldairycouncil.org. Um, uh, it's my pleasure again to introduce uh, Dr. Moses Torres Gonzalez, PhD, the Director for the Nutrition Research National Dairy Council, and Janice Giddens, the Director for the Health and Wellness Partnership National Dairy Council. Um, Dr. Uh, Torres Gonzalez is uh, the Director for the Nutrition Research and National Dairy Council, or also for short, DNC. At DNC, he serves as a subject matter expert on whole fat dairy uh, foods, cardiometabolic health, um, milk fat ingredients, inflammation and cognition. As the subject matter expert lead, his main role is to strateg strategically define, develop, and manage the research projects needed to build on our scientific understanding on whole fat dairy foods and uh, milk fat ingredients role on cardiometabolic health, inflammation, and cognition. That ultimately helps better position whole fat dairy foods with dietary um, recommendations to stimulate pro uh, product innovation, respectively. Um, Dr. Moises also uh, serves as the chair of the scientific committee of Hay uh, Protein Research Consortium, where he leads a nutrition research strategy uh, needed to create the scientific foundation for the Hay Protein's health effect, and that ultimately 
can be translated to new marketing opportunities for hay uh, protein supplements. And Janice Guinness is the registered dietitian nutritionist who understands the important role of agriculture in producing foods that nourish the body and, and planet from soil to plate and beyond from her work experience on farms and with farmers in Ecuador, United States, Mozambique, and Rwanda. As a director of the health and wellness partnerships at the uh, National Dairy Council, Janice collaborates with national health professional organizations and reputational thoughts leaders that educate them, their patients, about the links between agriculture, sustainable food systems, diet, and health. So we will start with uh, Dr. Torre Gonzalez. Well, thank you everyone and good afternoon. I want to welcome uh, again to these webinars. So before getting to the main part of my presentations, what I want to do is to give you some background information about the National Dairy Councils for those of you not familiar with. National Dairy Council is a nonprofit organization that was founded back in 1915 by American dairy farmers because they believed in science and the importance of understanding how dairy foods may benefit human nutrition and health. Today, NDC represents about 40,000 dairy farm families across the U.S. as well as dairy importers. On behalf of America's uh, dairy farmers and broad dairy community, our diverse team of scientists, registered dietitian nutritionists, and communication professionals has tried to bring to life the dairy community's shared vision of a healthy, happy, sustainable world with science as our foundation. U.S. dairy farmers and the U.S. dairy community believe in a world well-nourished and are committed to providing responsible produce nutritious dairy foods that help nourish people, strengthen communities, and foster a sustainable future. Now, talking about sustainable future, I'm sure that you all agree with me that the greatest challenge of our generation is to nourish a growing global population with limited natural resources. It is estimated that by 2050, the number of people on the planet will exceed 9 billion. Therefore, food production will need to increase by 70%. This is not only to feed, but to nourish this growing population. Some of the uh, increase in food demand is due, as I just mentioned it, due to the growing world population, but also is due to an increase in urbanization, global middle class, and economic growth, which is mostly concentrated in developing countries. Therefore, as incomes rise, so does demand for more diverse foods, including animal source proteins, such as meat, dairy, and eggs, and for edible oils, fruits and vegetables. But we must also recognize that this increase in food production must occur without increasing or use of natural resources. Now, in the context of sustainability, I must say that the U.S. dairy farmers have been leaders in this regard. It is because of efficiencies and best practices like precision breeding and nutrition, as well as water management and methane digester. A recent study found that to produce a gallon of milk today, it is done by using 20% less land, 30% less water, generating 20% less manure, and generating 19% uh, less greenhouse gases. And this is compared to 2007. The U.S. dairy community is committed to continuous improvements, and a study like this show the, the, the progress that we're making. But this is, of course, not a, our end game. <clears throat> Because the time constraints, I won't talk more about it, but you can learn more about dairy's role in health and sustainable food systems uh, from a past NDC webinar, which is archived on nationaldairycouncil.org. Now, getting to the weeds of my presentations, we are going to review the science on fat, saturated fat, dairy, and of course, on whole fat dairy, dairy foods. Let me start by saying that historically, Health authorities have made dietary recommendations focus, focusing on limiting certain nutrients such as fat, saturated fat, and cholesterol. And this uh, recommendation started after the publication of this very famous study called uh, Devin Cantor's study that was led by Ansel Kids. Basically, uh, this study found that those countries with the highest consumption of fat were also the countries with the highest mortality rate due to cardiovascular disease. 
as the nutrition science evolved, we have also seen in different uh, articles, for instance, published in, in the Time magazine, how our perception on certain nutrients has been changing over the years. For instance, from growing that, or getting uh, initial some articles, that consumption of fruits rich in cholesterol could kill us of a heart attack. And later on, saying that, well, maybe it's not. And late, lately, we have seen other articles, for instance, that maybe eating fat make not, uh, make, make not, fat, not fat. And recently, that consuming butter may also might not be as bad as we thought in the past. Now, in this slide, what I'm basically showing is the evolution of dietary fat guidance over the years. As you can see, this guidance has had modest modifications in terms of range of fat intake recommended. But in general, I should say that it hasn't changed much in terms of what type of fat we should limit. And the current focus continues on limiting saturated fat intake to no more than 10% of total calories. Now, you may ask why saturated fat is still a concern. Well, historically, saturated fat has been part of this hard diet, hard paradigm, which dictates that because saturated fat increases blood levels of LDL cholesterol, normally referred as the bad cholesterol, and because it is still thought that LDL cholesterol is the biomarker that better predicts cardiovascular disease and coronary heart disease, then it has been assumed that saturated fat increases coronary heart disease and CBD risk. However, the signs on diet and saturated fat has evolved. And here are two points that I want to make related to this. First of all, we have been learning that relying only on one biomarker to predict CBD risk oversimplifies a very complex disease. Nowadays, we can determine a series of different biomarkers to have a better picture to predict cardiovascular disease. Secondly, we have also now data from large cohort prospective studies that follow healthy individuals for a number of years until they develop a disease. Therefore, this type of evidence provides useful information to better understand the association of diet or saturated fat intake and CBD events beyond the effects on uh, blood biomarkers. Bottom line, what I'm saying here is that the latest evidence indicates that the real story between saturated fat and cardiovascular disease is more complex than what it was being thought in the past. Now, in this slide, as just an example of evidence that has been emerging in the last 10 years are the results from meta-analysis and systematic reviews, where you can see that consistently these studies have shown that saturated fat intake has not been linked with increased risk of coronary heart disease, CBD, stroke, or type 2 diabetes. For the sake of time, I cannot go into the details of each study, however, you can find there the, the, the references in case you want to uh, get into details of each study. Nevertheless, this emerging body evidence uh, questions the current recommendations on saturated fat. Now, while the results shown in the previous slide uh, suggest that saturated fat is not associated with risk of cardiovascular disease, health authorities and modeling studies indicate that this, associ this association depends on what nutrient saturated fat is compared to. For instance, modeling studies have shown that when swapping isocaloric amounts of saturated fat with simple carbohydrate, then there is not any additional benefits. However, replacing saturated fat with insaturated fats, especially polyunsaturated fats, this fat replacement is associated with reduced risk of CBD. And Although this has been used as a valid argument to defend current recommendations on saturated fat, the controversy that has arisen from this replacement approach is because we eat foods, not single nutrients. And also foods contain not only fat, but also other important nutrients. And foods are eaten within different dietary patterns, which makes even more complicated to predict the effect of a single nutrient on disease risk. Additionally, we have been learning that not all fat sources of saturated fat behave the same when we are trying to determine their association with cardiometabolic risk. And this could be the case for whole fat dairy foods. Now, let's move on and let's check what we have learned so far about the implication of dairy foods on cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. A, one, a, a point that I want to make here uh, before deep diving into this topic is that when I say dairy foods, I'm referring to milk, cheese, and yogurt. 
Additionally, as I will talk about cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes, I want to throw here some statistics about CBD mortality and type 2 incidence in the Hispanic population here in the U.S. As you can see here, CBD mortality is not as high in the Hispanic uh, population compared to any other ethnic groups. However, type 2 diabetes incidence is pretty high, and actually, the Hispanic population has the second highest incidence of type 2 diabetes. This is something to be really concerned. Now, because I won't have time to go through the entire body of evidence that shows the potential benefits of dairy foods with risk of CBD and type 2 diabetes and other related uh, health conditions, what I want to point out here is a series of scientific summaries available to download at nationaldairycouncil.org. These science summaries provide an excellent overview of the current science on dairy foods and different health conditions. But overall, I should say that the evidence, the emerging evidence demonstrates that total dairy consumption has either a neutral or beneficial association with reduced risk of CBD, type 2 diabetes, and also with lower risk of hypertension. I want to, uh, to make also another point here. When I mentioned total dairy consumption, this includes consumption of all varieties of dairy foods from fat-free to whole fat dairy options. Now, regarding specifically on whole fat dairy foods, the preponderance of scientific evidence indicates that whole milk dairy consumption is, a not, is not associated with increased risk of CBD or type 2 diabetes despite of the saturated fat content. Similarly, in nationaldairycouncil.org, you can easily download science summaries with a comprehensive review of the body evidence on whole fat dairy foods, CBD, and type 2 diabetes. Now, what I'm going to do, uh, and for the purpose of saving time, in the next uh, following slides, I will, I will be highlighting a few studies that are part of this growing body of evidence. In this slide, what I'm presenting is a summary of the results of this multi-country prospective study known as the PURE study that look at, at the association between dairy intake and CBD and mortality in 21 countries from five, uh, uh, co uh, 25 countries from five continents. The results from this study show that higher consumption of total dairy foods, this is regardless of the fat content, and when compared consuming more than two servings per day with no consumption, this was, this was linked to reduced risk of total mortality, non-cardiovascular mortality, cardiovascular disease mortality, major cardiovascular disease, and a stroke. Higher consumption of only whole fat dairy foods, and this was also when I was compared consuming more than two servings per day versus consuming less than 0.5 servings per day, this was associated with lower total mortality and major cardiovascular disease. In this another slide, what I'm showing is the main findings of a dietary intervention trial where it was compared the effects of consuming the DASH diet versus a modified high-fat DASH diet. I'm sure you all know what a DASH diet is. DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. The DASH dietary pattern basically is a very healthy dietary pattern highly recommended by health authorities. The DASH diet recommends the consumption of three servings of fat-free and low-fat dairy foods. And you, you can describe the, the DASH dietary pattern as a dietary pattern that is low in fat, low in saturated fat, and cholesterol. And this dietary pattern is very effective to reduce blood pressure and to improve different biomarkers related with reduction of CBD risk. Now, in this study, the modified high fat DASH diet was designed to include whole fat dairy foods instead of low fat and fat free dairy foods. And in order to maintain the same calorie levels in the high fat DASH diet, it was reduced the carbohydrate levels. And this table shows the macronutrient composition of, it, uh, of, the, two, of the two DASH diets. So the results show that compared to the standard DASH diet, the modified high fat DASH diet had similar benefits of lowering blood pressure, it reduced blood triglyceride levels and there were not a statistical differences in total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, or HDL cholesterol. To highlight is the no difference in total and LDL cholesterol, despite that in the high-fat DASH diet, they were consuming more saturated fat. So the main key takeaway from this study is that whole meal dairy foods can be incorporated 
in the, into a healthy dietary pattern that is calorie balanced and improves standard biomarkers related with cardiovascular disease. Now, talking about type 2 diabetes, results from systematic reviews and those response meta-analysis have found that total dairy food consumption is associated with lower risk of type 2 diabetes. For instance, in the studies that I'm showing here, one of them found that for every 400 grams servings per day of dairy food, there was a 7% reduced risk of type 2 diabetes. Similarly, in the other study, it was found that for every uh, 200 grams per day of dairy consumed, there was 6% risk reduction of type 2 diabetes. Other studies found as well beneficial association with consumption of low-fat dairy foods, skin milk, cheese, and yogurt. Just to give you an idea of what those uh, 400 grams of day of dairy a day look like and having a reference one of these studies, this would be equivalent to consuming a glass of milk, uh, 28 grams of cheese, and six ounces of yogurt. Basically, this would be equivalent to consume three servings as currently recommended. Now, observational studies that rely only on self-reported dietary intake have an important limitation known as recall bias meaning that participants may not correctly remember what they eat maybe a day before, a week before, or a year before. So this might lead to over-reporting or under-reporting dietary intake. Therefore, the results from this study might not be as strong as we would like to. So to overcome this limitation, experts in the field have proposed this other approach that basically is to determine in blood the levels of particular component or components found in a food. This method represents a more accurate way to estimate the intake of a food. In the case of whole fat dairy foods, studies have found that higher consumption of whole milk, regular cheese and yogurt, as well as dairy fat, is associated with higher levels of these particular fatty acids, pentadecanoic acid, heptadecanoic acid, and transpalmitoleic acid. Now, by using this um, dairy fat biomarker approach, a pool analysis from 16 prospective cohort studies from uh, 12 countries found that participants with higher circulating levels of fatty acid biomarkers of dairy fat consumption had lower risk of type 2 diabetes. And it was also found that people with higher levels of, sum, of the sum of those three fatty acids had 20% lower risk of type 2 diabetes compared with participants with lower levels of those fatty acids. The senior author of this study, uh, who is a well-known and respected expert on cardiovascular disease and nutrition research, stated that while U.S. and international guidelines can generally recommend low-fat or, or non-fat dairy food due to concerns to the calories and saturated, fat, and saturated fats, the results from this study suggest a need, a need to examine the potential metabolic benefits of dairy fats or foods rich in dairy fats, such as cheese. So based on the information that I have been sharing with you, I'm sure that now you are curious and wondering, is there something different about dairy fat? Let me start by first saying that foods are complex and we have been learning that food is more than the sum of its nutrients. Additionally, we have been learning that the food matrix, in other words, how these nutrients are found in a food, the interaction among these nutrients, their physical form of the foods consumed liquid, semi-liquid or solid, all of, all of these additional factors may impact differently and therefore determine uh, different effects of the food on health. And all of that could apply to the dairy food matrix. Before uh, going in deeper on this, I just want to remind everyone the nutrient contribution of a glass of milk. A glass of milk uh, provides nine essential nutrients. Here in the US, the most current NHANES data at the current day intake that is around 1.7 servings per day, indicates that overall dairy foods contribute more than 50% of vitamin D and calcium recommendations, but also they are important sources of these other important nutrients that are listed in this slide. Now, when talking about dairy fat, um, first of all, let me say that not all sources of saturated fat are the same. Now, specifically talking about dairy fat, this type of fat is actually very complex, natural occurring type of fat. It is composed of more than 400 different types of fatty acids. 
And, uh, and from this, 65 to 70% are saturated fatty acids, and 30 to 35% are unsaturated fatty acids. Additionally, I think it is important to highlight that not all saturated fatty acids are treated equal. This, uh, the saturated fat in dairy fat is composed of short chain, medium chain, old chain, long chain, brain chain fatty acids. And we know that each saturated fatty acid could have a very different physiological effect on blood lipids. Therefore, to predict the effect of whole fat dairy foods based only on total saturated fat content is oversimplistic. Super, super, super simplistic. Now, to add another layer to the complexity of dairy fats, we also have learned as well that the packaging of the fat may matter. Dairy fat naturally in dairy foods is encapsulated in a membrane called male fat global membrane, which is composed of potential bioactive components such as phospholipids and phingolipids and proteins. And some studies like the one that is shown in this slide have found that when milk fat is provided, encapsulated within the milk fat global membrane, like in this example as whipping cream, versus just providing it as milk fat as you uh, may find in a bottled oil, which bottled oil is depleted of milk fat glo global membrane, these, these two, 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 two products could have a completely different effect on blood lipids, as you can see in this graph. The presence of milk fat global membrane in this particular study, for instance, didn't impact LDL cholesterol, increase HDL cholesterol, and reduces plasma triglycerides. Now, adding to the concept of food, mod, uh, food matrix effects, we also have seen a series of dietary intervention trials that have compared the effects of cheese versus butter on blood lipids. Cheese and butter have the same type of fat. This systematic review that was, was published in 2015 um, included results from five randomized controlled trials. And the findings that were uh, reported is that when compared to an equivalent amount of butter, cheese consumption reduced total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and HDL cholesterol. It has been hypothesized that calcium and protein may attenuate or may reduce the absorption of fat. Also, that some specific fatty acids that might be produced during the fermentation process also could attenuate the effects of saturated fat on LDL cholesterol. And of course, the food matrix of cheese because it's different to the food matrix of butter. Now, within dairy foods, we also found fermented dairy foods like cheese and yogurt. I don't have time to go through some exciting results we have seen with yogurt. However, I want to point out some important aspects of fermented foods. Fermented uh, dairy foods are, source, are sources of active microbes and important bioactives and vitamins that can be produced during the fermentation process, which might help improve food digestibility, enhance the immune system, improve the good microbiota, and overall, it could have a positive impact on human health. Now, with the evolution on the science on saturated fat and dairy foods, also we have seen some health authorities that have been changing the dietary recommendations. For instance, back in 2015, the Canadian Hair and Stroke Foundation uh, published a position paper on the emerging evidence on saturated fat and uh, dietary recommendations. They acknowledged that the emerging evidence suggests that the health effects of saturated fats could vary depending on the food sources in which they are found. Also, the recommendations, the dietary recommendations, uh, do not include a threshold or limit for saturated fat, and instead the focus uh, is on healthy to follow a healthy balanced dietary pattern, which can help to reduce consumption of saturated fat. Similarly, here in the U.S., the Jocelyn Diabetes Center, a world leader institution on diabetes treatment and research, published these dietary guidelines back in 2017. Similarly, they acknowledged this emerging evidence, and they indicated that recent evidence demonstrates that saturated fats from dairy foods may be acceptable within the total dairy ca uh, daily calorie intake. Also, dairy foods were included in this list of food shown to be associated with a reduced risk of developing type 2 diabetes in some studies. More recently, 
Last year, the Australian Heart Foundation published its dietary guidelines, which now includes whole milk, yogurt, and cheese as dairy choices in their new healthy eating guidelines. Overall, they stated that milk, cheese, and yogurt, regardless of the fat content, are encouraged as part of the heart healthy eating principles. Here in the U.S., I must say that the previous and the last uh, DGE committee's report were basically the report that informed the dietary guidelines, recognized the role of dairy foods on health. In the reports, it was indicated that consumption of milk and milk products is associated with reduced risk of CBD, type 2 diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, and to lower blood pressure. And just a reminder, since 2005, dietary guidelines recommends three daily servings of dairy foods as part of healthy eating patterns for those nine years and older for the multiple health benefits that I just mentioned before. Now, I want to briefly mention these type of uh, results that also I think that are exciting to know. In addition to potentially reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes, dairy foods as part of healthy diet have also been linked with less uh, long-term weight gain. Data from uh, three separate cohorts examine the relationship between various foods and lifestyle factors and weight change every four years for 20 years. In the figure that I'm showing here, the bars to the right of the zero indicate foods which were associated with weight gain, while bars to the left of the zero indicate foods associated with weight loss. Specific to dairy, the authors found that increased consumption of cheese has not appreciable effect on body weight regardless of the fat levels. However, each serving per day of yogurt was found to be associated with just under a pound of weight loss over four years. This benefit was on pair of slightly greater to other foods typically associated with reduced body weight, such as vegetables, whole grains, fruits, and nuts. Now, specific uh, to fluid milk, the authors found that increased consumption of low fat has not appreciable effect on body weight. In contrast, consumption of whole meal tended to decrease body weight over the four years period. Now, given the importance of overweight and obesity as independent risk factors for the development of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, the potential specifically uh, for yogurt to be a tool for weight management and thus a piece of the puzzle for reducing their long-term risk of type 2 diabetes and CBD it's really exciting. Findings such as this open the door for more research to better understand this relationship. Quickly, what I want to show here is um, results from another systematic review of the observational evidence that evaluated the association of whole fat dairy food consumption and risk of obesity. Overall, the authors concluded that evidence coming from observational studies does not support that consuming whole fat dairy foods is associated with increased risk of obesity. On the contrary, it was found that whole fat dairy consumption within healthy diet is associated with reduced risk of obesity. Now, considering that obesity is a serious health problem for the Hispanic population, not only in adults, but also in children, I hope that, you, that what you are learning from this presentation could encourage you to think about dairy foods to improve one's diet or your patient's diet. Now, talking about flex, uh, fat flexibility, I should say that current dietary guidelines actually allow flexibility for nutrient-dense foods that contains a small amounts of saturated fat, as long as saturated fat does not exceed 10% of total calories consumed. Summarizing my presentation, we have seen that emerging evidence from population studies and meta-analysis shows that saturated fat consumption is not associated with cardiovascular disease. Also, uh, what have, we have been learning is that dairy foods have a neutral or beneficial association with reduced risk for CBD, type 2 diabetes, and with lower, uh, with lower risk of hypertension. Same emerging uh, research suggests that fat in dairy foods may have unique properties that differentiate it from other uh, food sources of saturated fat. Some professional organizations have begun to evolve recommendations to emphasize saturated fat and are recognized that not all food sources of saturated fat are equal. And although the science is evolving, there are still limits to saturated fat consumption in dietary combination. 
we recommend uh, recommendations set at less than 10% of total calories. This is in the case of uh, dietary guidelines for Americans. Whole meal dairy foods can be part of a healthy eating styles outlined by the dietary guidelines, but we have to be mindful of other food choices to balance saturated fat and calorie intake to stay within uh, recommended amounts. And finally, the research on dairy fat and cardiometabolic health is unfolding and promising. However, it is important to conduct more research to better understand the link. With this, I finish my presentation and then I pass over Janice. Thank you for your presentation and the review of the science, Moises. And Dr. Rios and Dr. Vinales, thank you so much for the warm welcome and introduction. Now I'm going to talk about how we translate the science to the plate, keeping in mind the nutrients people should consume every day and the palatability and acceptability of foods that we consume every day. Now, as a reminder, milk contains a powerful nutrient package of nine essential nutrients in each serving. In fact, it is the number one food source of three of the four under-consumed nutrients of public health concern identified by the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, which include calcium, vitamin D, and potassium. In addition, nutrient-rich milk is the primary ingredient for yogurt, which provides seven nutrients, and cheese, which provides six nutrients per serving. Regardless of the fat content of the dairy product that your patients choose, you can expect to receive this powerful nutrient package from your dairy foods. Milk is the foundational component for all dairy foods, and it provides this powerful package of nutrients that work together synergistically to develop a nutritional punch. You may have heard this being referred to earlier in the presentation as the food matrix or the milk matrix. And from milk, we get calcium, vitamin D, and phosphorus, nutrients that we all know are crucial for strong bones and strong teeth. We also get high quality protein that supports healthy muscles, a multitude of vitamins, of B vitamins that are necessary for energy metabolism, vitamin A, which is incredibly important for healthy skin and eyes, and vitamin B12 that supports the production of red blood cells. Occasionally, we hear people say that it's easy to replace calcium in milk with other foods like leafy greens and dairy alternatives. The reality is the unique nutrient package of milk makes it challenging to substitute with other foods and beverages. And I, this slide here that we have shows some of the foods and the amounts that you would need to be able to consume in a day to meet the nutrient package that three servings of milk provide. And because of the unique nutrient profile, Milk, cheese, and yogurt are foundational foods included in multiple eating patterns, which include the healthy eating patterns of the 2015 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension Eating Plan, eating patterns recommended by the American Heart Association, and guidelines from the National Osteoporosis Foundation. Due to their nutrient contribution and review of the evidence that notes dairy consumption is linked to lower risk for cardiovascular disease, lower risk for type 2 diabetes, and improved bone health, especially in children and adolescents. The last three sets of dietary guidelines for Americans recommend three daily servings of dairy foods for people nine years and above. Now, let's take a look at how we're doing when it comes to the consumption of dairy foods. We often hear a lot about how people are not eating enough fruits and vegetables, but few people realize that nearly nine out of 10 people in America fall short on the dietary guidelines recommendations for dairy foods. As you can see in the blue box, Americans consume on average less than two cup equivalents of dairy foods per day. Adding just one more serving of dairy a day would help people meet the recommendations and close shortfall nutrient gaps to support health benefits. And this is a really recent survey that was done in 2019 by the Hartman Group. It shows us where people are focused when it comes to ingredients and nutrients they want to add to their diet. Fiber tops the list, followed by three prominent nutrients found in milk, which are protein, vitamin D, and calcium. So it seems like people are starting to hear the messages about important nutrients that are needed in a healthy diet. And if you look down the chart, third from the bottom, 21% of consumers say they are adding or increasing full-fat dairy in their diet. Perhaps that's because they are seeing it more on the shelves or seeing more health-related information about it and trying it. Maybe it's because they like the taste of it better. 
The fact of the matter is that our patients and clients may be interested in trying full fat dairy and we need to be able to help them navigate how and when to add it to their diet. The fat flexibility and versatility is the message that we can share with them. And as I mentioned, it's important to be able to discuss the concept of fat flexibility while also remembering dairy product versatility combined with its affordability, availability, accessibility, and nutrient density make it an important food group. If people are having skim, one or 2% dairy and they are happy with it, great. But if they wanna incorporate full fat dairy, we can make sure they are doing it in a way that ensures they are staying within the Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommendations for 10% or less of calories coming from saturated fat while also meeting the recommendation for three servings of dairy every day. Now, depending on the individual, the addition of full fat dairy may not just be an add to the diet, but it may be a swap for in place of something else to make sure that they are staying within the healthy eating patterns recommended by the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. What's in your for? This may all look familiar to some of you, so let's take a look though at the milk across the spectrum of options based on fat content that are available to consumers. And let's start with some of the similarities that we can see here from this slide. From skim milk to whole milk, any choice you make is going to provide you with eight grams of high quality protein, as well as 30% of your recommended daily value of calcium and the same powerful package of nutrients per serving that we discussed earlier. And remember, when we talk about one serving of milk, we're talking about one eight ounce glass. Now, as you can see from this slide, the only difference is are the amount of fat and calories. Skin milk has zero grams of fat, 1% milk has 2.5 grams of fat, 2% milk has five grams of fat, and whole milk has eight grams of fat per serving. And the calorie levels are different as well, from 80 calories up to 150 calories per serving. There's a lot of versatility here and room for flexibility based on lifestyle, age, preferences, and culinary applications. So let's look at this another way. These labels highlight the amount of calories contained in an 8-ounce serving of whole milk and an 8-ounce serving of skim milk, a difference of 70 calories per serving. If someone opted to consume three glasses of whole milk per day versus three glasses of skim milk per day, that would be a difference of 210 calories. And could someone make, up, make some simple swaps or reductions in their daily caloric intake to make up for this difference? Yes, they could easily make some simple swaps to be able to consume whole milk if that is their preference, while still adhering to the Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommendations. Plus, let's not forget about the powerful nutrient package they are receiving when they follow the Dietary Guideline recommendations for three servings of dairy every day. When it comes to counseling our patients about fat flexibility, I find this acronym SET to be really helpful for your patients to remember some important principles about fat flexibility. In order for someone to stay within their calories and fat count, the S stands for swap, less nutritious sources of full or fat for fuller fat, nutrient-rich dairy foods. The E for ensure your snacks stack up. And another key point is to T, think about portion sizes. Now, if we're looking at guiding our clients with a fat-flexible approach, what are the questions that we might want to ask? Well, the first one is, are you having three servings of dairy every day? If the answer is yes, then we can ask them, are they all reduced fat, low fat, or fat free? Are you happy with those dairy choices in terms of taste, how they function in recipes? What about the satiety or satisfaction that you get from them? If the answer again is yes, then great. Stick with what you're doing. But if the answer is no, then maybe it's time to re-examine the diet and find ways to include more satisfying dairy foods that help the person derive more satisfaction from their foods while also ensuring that they receive the essential nutrients that three servings of dairy will provide. If someone says they are not using all low fat, reduced fat, or fat-free dairy, then we want to assess if their calorie and saturated fat intake are within recommended limits. If so, great, keep enjoying your favorite dairy food. The answer is no, where might we be able to make some changes in the diet to reduce calories and fat from less nutrient dense foods in the diet so they can enjoy their favorite dairy foods? Now back to our original question. 
about three servings of dairy per day. If they're not getting their three servings of dairy every day, then we might offer up some suggestions. Some things to consider the versatility of milk, cheese, and yogurt to be incorporated into dishes and paired with other foods. We can discuss things like taste and texture modifications, health benefits, and improving the acceptability of other foods when they are paired with dairy. In order to help people increase their intake of dairy to the recommended three servings per day, to make sure they're not missing out on the powerful package of nutrients that dairy will provide. Now, we're going to look at some ways that we can do that. Let's start off with a look at milk. Maybe someone wants to incorporate whole milk into their diet and they really enjoy the creamy mouthfeel and texture and taste of whole milk. They could enjoy it straight up or blend it with fruit for refreshing liquato or batido. It could be added to black coffee for a delicious cafe con leche or combined with strained rice water and spices for a quick and creamy horchata. And speaking of horchata, you can find a delicious recipe on nationaldairycouncil.org. Now, if someone's trying to cut back on calories or prefers skim one, 2% milk, they can choose to drink three eight ounce glasses per day. They can make their avania or oatmeal with it to up the amount of nutrients they're getting. It's also a great addition to cold cereal and it can be whipped for lattes and cappuccinos. And next up, we have yogurt. If someone is looking for the taste and texture full fat dairy products provide, whole milk yogurt provides that creamy texture. Now they can also thin it with lime juice to make a salad dressing. They can mix it with avocado and spices to make a creamy and tangy guacamole. They can add a dollop to foods such as tacos and burritos. And if someone is trying to figure out how to increase their dairy servings while conserving calories by using 2%, 1%, or fat-free yogurt, they can use it to make a beautiful marinade for meat, poultry, or fish because the lactic acid in the yogurt tenderizes the meat. They could also use it in place of mayonnaise or crema in esquete, or even use a Greek or Icelandic style of yogurt to thicken and add a boost of protein to dips. And last, but certainly not least, there is cheese. For the taste and texture lover, and I want us all to think about how nicely higher fat cheeses will melt. Someone compare queso chihuahua or Oaxaca with vegetables and stuff inside a quesadilla or arepa they could shred, crumble, and sprinkle queso blanco or fresco on tacos, tapusas, tapitos, or beans and rice. And add cheeses like cotija or enchilada to a jicama salad. Now, if your patients are trying to conserve calories, pairing cheeses like part skim mozzarella or Oaxaca with almonds for a snack, can, they, they could also use reduced fat cheddar to lighten up some mac and cheese, or spread a layer of whipped cottage cheese on whole grain bread and topped with sliced fruit for a delicious breakfast. All right, now let's take a look at what fat flexing for a delicious and nutritious day might look like. For breakfast, it could be a bowl of overnight oats or avania, mixed in reduced fat plain Greek yogurt with slivered almonds, strawberries, and a sliced banana. For lunch, a portobello mushroom sandwich made with grilled portobello wrapped in a whole wheat pita pocket or burrito shell with 1.5 ounces of cow's milk feta or cotija, and a smear of hummus or avocado slices with sliced tomatoes and a handful of spinach. For an afternoon snack, one and a half tablespoons of peanut butter with some apple slices be a delicious treat. And for dinner, a pasta caprese made with one cup of pasta, one cup of zucchini noodles or your favorite veggies, 1.5 ounces of bocconcini or your favorite soft cheese, paired with a half cup of shrimp, and one tablespoon of pesto. And then the evening snack. You can do a popsicle that's made with a half cup of 2% milk and a quarter cup of frozen berries. Now, as we wrap up, I hope you have a better understanding of the science of whole milk dairy foods within healthy eating patterns. For more evidence-based materials to ensure you have the latest on dairy's role in health and sustainable food systems, please visit nationaldairycouncil.org. Not only will you find the science summaries Moises mentioned, we have delicious recipes to help bring the tips that I provided to life, as well as a host of other information. On the right-hand side of the slide, you can see one of my favorite posts that helps address common questions about dairy from A to Z. And lastly, I invite you to join the Dairy Nourishes Network. 
As a member of the network, you will receive a quarterly newsletter from National Dairy Council, as well as a host of other resources, recipes, and opportunities. If you're not already a member of the Dairy Nourishes Network, you can join through the post survey you will receive. In addition to this post survey, you will also receive a recording of the webinar and handout, PDF handouts of our slides. So thank you again for your time and attention. I will now turn it back over to our moderator, Dr. Vinale, for questions. Thank you guys for this great uh, set of presentations. Um, and I'm going to start some questions of my own. And uh, uh, the question section is open for everybody. It's just uh, uh, type it in and we'll uh, accommodate as much as we can. So what about the inflammatory nature of dairy foods? What, to what extent is that true? Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Manuelis. Uh, I think that there's a very common question that we get and maybe uh, uh, information that, uh, to be honest, I don't understand where that came from. Mm -hmm. Now, on one hand, the way that I would respond to this question is that we have, uh, the, the evidence that I show is that dairy food consumption is, re is associated with reduced risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And we know that these uh, two diseases, all, uh, inflammation is one of the main drivers of the onset and progression of these diseases. Now, if dairy foods were pro-inflammatory, we have seen that actually dairy foods would increase the risk of, of these diseases. However, we have seen the opposite. Now, regarding specifically to the evidence on dairy and inflammation, what we have seen, even when the evidence is still limited, is that actually dairy foods have been associated with lower grade of inflammation. And there have been some studies that have looked at, for instance, the effect of yogurt on inflammation. And we have seen is that consumption of yogurt is associated with lower risk of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, with lower inflammatory uh, biomarkers. And the other uh, uh, information that I want to provide regarding to this point is that we know that there are some components in dairy foods, such as some bioactives of some fractions of the proteins that are found in, in dairy foods that actually have potential antioxidant activities. And also there are some studies that have shown precisely that the consumption of protein coming from, from dairy foods increases the, the, the synthesis of glutathione. Glutathione is an important and very powerful antioxidant that our body produces precisely to, to, to reduce uh, the formation of oxidative products that later on could induce inflammation. So bottom line, the evidence uh, until now suggests that actually dairy food could be uh, anti-inflammatory. Excellent. So although I have some other questions on my own, I'm gonna get some from uh, our audience. Uh, someone uh, has asked, for clients that require alternative milks, what recommendations do you suggest for calcium supplementation? We utilize fortified uh, rice milk, but is there a combination of vitamins and minerals that is more bioavailable? Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So uh, basically, somebody is asking uh, uh, people that require alternative milks. What are, is their recommendation for suggest, that is suggested for calcium supplementation? Basically, instead of using uh, milk, using alternative milk. That's yeah. Right. Um, so, you know, I think unless someone has a cow's milk allergy, and, and I'm not really sure kind of what the basis is for recommending the rice milk, um, but typically uh, the plant-based milk alternatives do not have the same nutrient profile that dairy does. And as we showed on the slide earlier, which these will be available later, um, it takes a lot of different foods to be able to provide not only the calcium, but the other eight essential nutrients that are within dairy foods. And if someone does have a cow's milk allergy, that is a conversation that certainly needs to happen between the provider and a dietitian 
and the patient so that they can work with their individual food preferences to see if they are able to get those foods um, into that person's diet, and if not, work together as a healthcare providing team to be able to provide the appropriate supplementation regimen that they would see fit for that patient based on their lifestyle, based on their age, and based on their preferences. Thank you. Uh, so one of my own questions again, uh, how does the data for the dairy compares to other sources, uh, food sources of saturated fat? Uh, well, that's, that's a very good question and also very common. Uh, what we have been learning, for instance, is as I indicated, that not all sources of saturated fat have the same impact. Well, uh, there has been a few studies that have precisely evaluated the association of different sources of saturated fat with cardiovascular uh, disease risk. And so far, what we have learned is that, for instance, saturated fat coming from, for instance, from meat is associated with increased risk of CBD. And for instance, sa uh, saturated fat coming from dairy food is associated with lower risk of CBD. Also, there's some data there that have uh, also looked at uh, other sources of saturated fat, such as butter and tropical oils. And, and there, because the, the consumption is still not very high, very, very prominent, the association cannot be determined. So right now, I would say that based on the uh, available evidence is that saturated fat coming from meat is associated with increased risk and uh, saturated fat coming from dairy is not associated with CBD risk. Okay, so another uh, question from the audience. Um, somebody uh, just asked us, there, is, there was a study published in January 15th saying uh, that drinking 1% rather than 2% milk accounts for four and a half years of less aging in adults. Any thoughts regarding that study? Uh, what was the, la the, last, the last question, sorry? Yes, apparently there is a very recent study showing that mm -hmm. you drinking 1% milk instead of 2% milk accounts mm -hmm. for um, four and a half years of less aging in adults. She, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the person did not uh, say what was the, um, the, the specifically what is the um, journal that this was published. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, uh, yes, I, I, was re I was just reading that paper in the morning. And oh! It, it, yes, <laughs> yes. So it's kind of interesting because, yes, I mean, from molecular biology, what we have learned is that these telomeres that normally are part of the gene, they, when they are shortened, it, they're supposedly that is associated with uh, less years to live, if you will. And again, these have, have been very general uh, results indicating that, but normally this has been shown in animal studies. Now, in this study, it was uh, related with uh, consumption of, of uh, skin milk and 2% uh, of milk. And indeed, apparently in this study, it, it was shown that those people with uh, higher consumption of whole meal of 2% uh, uh, of milk had lower uh, or, show, uh, or shorter uh, telomere compared with people consuming uh, skin milk. From there, they, they were assuming that those people then would have a longer life, if you will. However, here are many limit. well, there are some still limitations of this study. First of all, we don't know what is the context of when people are consuming these different dairy products. What I mean to say is, for instance, what is the other lifestyles, right? Because if they are physically active, they are eating also more fruit and vegetables, uh, smoke, drink, uh, alcohol consumption, because all those factors uh, also contribute uh, uh, to decrease or increase your risk of a disease and, or your risk of, of mortality. So I think that even when the, the result seems interesting, I think that there are more more to, that needs to be done in order to, to have better understanding and to see if this is really applicable to real life. Okay. So Dr. Gonzalez and, and Janice, thank you so much for staying with us. We already reached 2 p.m. and I think it's time to wrap it up. 
uh, if I would say just a sentence or so, let's help America to drink more of dairy products. It seems that there is a lot of benefits from it. All right. I thank you all and hope to see you in more efforts in improving um, America uh, dietary education. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vinales. Thank you.